So here's an article from 1865 in the Wheeling Intelligencer, and I think this is interesting for a couple reasons. It's talking about the City Library Association and that all should be proud of it. Um, but I think this, the, the second paragraph is very interesting. Every citizen for the sake of his family, if not for himself, should be an annual subscriber. The price of subscription is the merest trifle, only $5, and whereas the man who loves to read or who deserves to cultivate a taste for reading in his family cannot pay that small sum. $5 in 1865 was a lot of money. <laughs> that, that would not have been something that the average person would have had in his pocket walking around Germany. So you call it a trifle sum, maybe do this to the editor of the newspaper, but would not have been to the citizens of the wheel. So then they say, fellow citizens, do not hoard up dollars for your children to the exclusion of advantage far more beneficial to them than dollars for the library, is what they're saying here. Give them the benefits of an excellent institution like the library by giving it grant. So it's very strong support for uh, people uh, to, to monetarily help with the City Library Association. As early as 1877, there was some discussion in the city about a public library. Now, we should have a public library. The better cities in, this, in the country have public libraries. We need a public library. And so while these early years for subscription libraries were difficult, the Civil War affected what, uh, but the association actually did very well until about 1881. And then that, that uh, association was disbanded. And it ultimately then became the collection for the Wheeling Public Library. So after, after it closed, after that subscription library closed, library association, the Board of Education in 1882 started getting interested in promoting a library in, in, uh, in the city. Now, remember, Wheeling, the Wheeling Ohio County Board was one of the very few public institutions providing free public ed education at that time. There was not a lot of that happening because of uh, the Civil War decimated a lot of, of the, the budgets, but in Wheeling that was happening. And so the board created and this all history keeps on coming around because right now, of course, the Board of Education is very involved in whether this library's budget will survive. And so it, it harkens back to this time it started back then. Uh, so they created a library committee, and later on in 1882, legislation was passed by the state legislature. Towns didn't have home rule then, as they don't now, chartering the public library of the city of Wheeling and permitting the levying of taxes to support the library. That was important. There needed to be some levying authority provided so that they financially could support the library. And so the Wheeling Library Association Board of Trustees agreed for their collection to be absorbed by this new public library. Now let's talk a little bit about Andrew Carnegie, because he was important in, um, in the, the scheme of things here as far as library development around the world, actually, but especially in the United States. Let me get to my notes here. Carnegie, uh, if, you, if you met the terms that Andrew Carnegie set out, which usually involved uh, maintenance of every dollar in a proper site and proper plans. He, he gave you what you asked for generally, unless the request was too large. So there was no one ever turned down by Andrew Carnegie or his corporation um, for a library grant if they met all the, the conditions that he wanted to meet. So I, I think that's interesting that he, uh, he, he was in the business of, of giving people the money, but there were terms and conditions to it. And in West Virginia, there were four, five, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine cities or bodies asking money from Carnegie, uh, but only the four in red are the ones who received dollars from it. So the others did not. So um, about not quite half, 42% of the request. $241,000, um, 241, $241,000 was the request of all of them, but only the one, only Huntington, Parkersburg, Bethany, 
and Hinton. And, and Bethany is not unique. There were some college libraries built, but Bethany's library was built with Carnegie money, and I, I believe it's, um, I think it's Cramlet Hall yeah. up there that was the old library. It was not built very well. There were okay. issues structurally with it and some other things that happened. But uh, of course, they're not in that. That's not a library. Like library now, but there weren't a lot of college dollars provided by Carnegie, but there was in West Virginia. So Wheeling, which would have gotten the largest grant, did not take his money. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Bluefield did not. Williamson did not. Charleston. I know you can't see the text on this, but you can see the graphic of it. There was often controversy with Carnegie and his philanthropy because of his labor issues. And so in this particular um, cartoon, you see him trying to give out libraries here when he's on the other side holding down the wages of his employees and his, his thumb down on his employees. There were, just to put this all in context, um, let me put the other eyes on just a moment. Old age. From 1886 to 1917, Carnegie donated 56,162,000 $622 for 2,509 library buildings in the United States and other places in the world. As I said before, no one who agreed to those terms was refused. But 225 communities did not follow through on his offer. So um, in most cases, it was it, there were there were several cases. The 56 cases that were unknown, there was not enough documentation for people to know why. But most, most of the other cases related to money, they couldn't raise the money, or they couldn't rent, get a site, or they wanted more money. Uh, in, in 21 communities, the local vote defeated the acceptance of the grant, and Wheeling is one of those communities. So, and if you're interested, I'll just read real quick through the list. Those communities who voted down um, the Carnegie grant were Albany, New York, Batesville, Indiana, Burrow, Michigan, Rutherfield, Missouri, Cumberland, Maryland, Darien, Connecticut, Deep River, Connecticut, Edgar, Nebraska, Frankfurt, New York, Granville, New York, Guthrie Center, Iowa, Hudson Falls, New York, Madison, Indiana, Marine City, Michigan, Neosho, Missouri, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, Pensacola, Florida, Saratoga, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Chicago, Illinois, and New York, West Virginia. So, There were instances where people said they didn't want just money or couldn't get some money, but more often than not, if you met his conditions, which generally involved 10% maintenance of effort that you had to agree to, you had to agree to plans that they approved because often these communities would want to build these huge monuments, big behemoths, and they just wouldn't approve that. Or in some instances, like in Charleston, you know, Charleston was a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. They wanted more money. They said, we need a bigger or grander library. You should give us some more money. And Carnegie said no. <laughs> There's another uh, cartoon where um, this is really to Detroit, where the taxes are so onerous on the citizens, but yet they're good. There's Carnegie with his library. And, his, and the maintenance there would have been $100,000 a year. So you know that would have been significant. So there was opposition from time to time. There is a book up here. I brought some books up here on the Carnegie Library. Um, it's called Carnegie Denied, where they went through and um, looked at the instances where people did not get Carnegie dollars. This, this has an interesting connection. When I was doing my historical research, it was around that time of Wayne Wagon, uh, who was who's a library historian. And at that time, I think he was in Kentucky, was doing some research. And they came across an article that was written about this by David Jabersack. Most of you know Dr. Jabersack. And David Jabersack's article was the idea behind looking at this. 
when they started reading his article and, and saw that they're in Wheeling, the playground position, which we'll talk about in a moment, where there are other instances where that happens. So that's how this book came. But the definitive book on Carnegie Libraries is this one here by Bobinski, who details all the grants, who got them, how much. But so if you're dying to know Carnegie's stuff, the others are coffee table type books. So, all right. 